Hey guys, thanks for checking out my newest tutorial on how to make a 100% whole wheat sourdough bread. My name is Kristen and I'm a home baker from Chicago. The goal today, a 100% whole wheat loaf, hearty and rich in flavor, yet with a light and tender crumb. After many trials, I've found that sticking with a simple minimalistic method is sufficient to achieve this. Be sure to check out my Instagram page at Foolproof Baking for more recipes, techniques, and experiments. And also be sure to check out my supplemental PDF booklets as a way to help support my channel. These downloads allow you to get a little something extra in return. Links to these pages can be found in the description notes below this YouTube tutorial. In the description below, I've also posted an outline of this tutorial with clickable timestamps that will take you to precisely the subject area of interest. I will go into some deep dive discussion on certain aspects of this bake here, so please feel free to skip ahead as you wish. For today, we're going to be covering this flowchart, and note the simplicity. We'll be converting our sourdough starter to 100% whole wheat throughout the first day, and by the evening, we'll mix up an autolyse. We'll then add the levain and the salt, bulk overnight in a cool spot to slow down the ferment, and the next morning, shape, proof, and bake. To help us gauge the extent of the fermentation and dough rise, we'll be using a technique called the aliquot jar method. You may have seen my control experiments and cold bulking experiments using the aliquot jar published back in 2018 on my Instagram page, and I'll post the link below. You may be asking, what is an aliquot? How does this help us gauge dough rise? So an aliquot is simply a small piece of the whole, and in our case, a small piece of our fermenting dough. If you are bulking larger quantities of dough as one mass, you can pretty easily see the rate of rise just using your container. However, with a small single dough, it can be difficult to assess how much the dough is rising over time. This little aliquot will help us to visualize the rise in a more clear way. I like to use a small spice jar with straight, narrow sides. So after adding in all the ingredients to the dough, meaning the flour, water, levain, and salt, I cut off a small piece of the dough and just place that in this little spice jar. Press it down to the bottom of the jar. I mark the volume of it with a rubber band and then place this jar right snug up against the main dough in the bulking container. You'll allow the dough to rest, and then once the aliquot is measuring at some given rise, say 100% rise, or once it's doubled in volume, this indicates you can go ahead and shape your main dough. Okay, so there are a few limitations here. The technique seems to work best in my hands when bulking dough at a cooler temperature. The dough must also be mixed quite well before pulling the small piece or this aliquot may have a different composition of levain and salt than your main dough. And you really need this aliquot to be representative of the whole dough. It also seems to be most accurate when working with higher hydration doughs as compared to stiff ones. It is essential that your aliquot jar share the exact same environmental conditions of your main dough, and this includes airflow. Otherwise, the dough in the jar could presumably rise faster or slower than the main bulking dough and will not be an accurate indicator of the rate of rise. So finding a temperature-stable, draft-free area during your bulk works best here. Try to minimize temperature fluctuations as the tiny aliquot can change temperature faster than the larger mass of dough. Now, how far do we push the dough rise before ending bulk and shaping? So this depends on many things. The flour you choose, your hydration, temperature, the activity of your starter. But generally in my experience, I find success when I shoot for about a 90 to 100% rise in the aliquot jar. And this seems to be a good indicator to go ahead and shape the dough. Note that if you bulk to 100% rise in the aliquot jar, and then you tip out your dough, shape, proof, and bake, and find your loaf is over-fermented, the next time, only allow the aliquot to rise to say 85 or 90% before shaping. And likewise, if you find your loaf to be under-fermented, allow the aliquot to rise a little further, maybe 110, 120% before shaping. So really, the best use of this jar is to run the same dough again and again 
and you can use it to narrow in on your optimal degree of fermentation. After a while, you'll become more intuitive and proficient at calling the end of bulk, and then you can just stop using the aliquot jar. I hope this makes sense, and feel free to leave questions in the comments section below. I'll try to best answer them as they come. Here are the baker's percentages, but just note that as I go through the video, I'll be discussing all aspects about the flour choice, how to find the right hydration for your given flour, and how I make the whole wheat levan, and I'll be sure to give all of the measurements in grams as we go through. So before we dive in, I'd like to take a quick moment to discuss flour choice and the flour stress test. I work with many different flours, and when they first arrive, I know a few things about them. The way they were milled, the type of wheat, be it spring or winter, hard or soft, red or white, as well as the protein percentage value on the bag. But rather than looking to the protein percentage value itself, which can sometimes be an unreliable gauge for how well the flour will perform, I like to assess the flour using the flour stress test. So the premise is simple. You take a bit of your given flour, stir in some water, and then after a rest period, you can gauge how much water the flour can handle and how extensible the dough becomes, how much tearing there is depending on gluten quality, and how much strength potential the dough might have. Whenever you work with a new flour, a flour you've never used in a recipe before, I think it is good practice to try this method to see what might be in store for you when you subject the flour to the pressure of extended fermentation. So here we go. I've chosen these two flours to work with for this particular recipe. I'm going to use a 50-50 mix of these two hard red spring wheat flours, one of which is a red fife heirloom wheat. Both are 100% extraction or whole berry, and both are high in protein, have a wonderful flavor, great to use in whole wheat bread. Let's see how these stack up in the flour stress test. I've taken 50 grams each of the Camas Red Fife, the King Arthur Whole Wheat, and then in a separate container, I mixed half and half, 25, 25 grams. I'm gonna add water to each of these and stir so that the final hydration is 95%. You would choose the particular hydration you're interested in. For white flour, by the way, you may wish to start with a much lower hydration, like 70 to 80 percent. After stirring, cover these up and let them rest at room temperature for one hour. After the rest period, now we can play with the dough. First up, the red fife. I fold the dough on itself, checking for extensibility and for stickiness. Really push the dough. See how much you can take before it begins to break the window pane. Tugging on the dough can also give you a sense of strength of the gluten at that given hydration. Very nice gluten development here at 95%. Now the King Arthur whole wheat. So this is a little stronger, more stiff in consistency. I guess this is more thirsty and soaked up a little more of that water, but overall a very strong dough. And the mixed flour sample is sort of in the middle of the two extremes, as expected. These doughs were tested at 95% hydration for this stress test, and I think this will actually be a good hydration for the final dough. Let's ball these guys up, and we'll let them sit and watch how they loosen up and slacken over the next half hour. You can see how this test could be super helpful to give you insight before you even subject the flours to the actual fermentation. To make a 100% whole wheat sourdough bread, we have to first convert the starter that we have to 100% whole wheat. If your starter is already on 100% whole wheat feed, please feel free to skip ahead to the next part of the method. My starter, Ozzy, is regularly fed with a mix of 90% bread flour, 10% rye. And this bread flour gives it a ton of strength. It's capable of rising 3 to 4x in volume after a given feed. By the way, if you don't already have a sourdough starter, please see my starter from scratch tutorial and I'll post the link below. And also see my tutorial on how to fully activate your starter ahead of a bake before diving into this Levan prep scene here. During my early testing, I noticed that when I first switched to whole wheat for my feeds, my starter rose super fast. 
Dropping the hydration so that you're working with a stiff starter can help slow the time to peak and add additional strength. And the more you dilute your starter, the longer it will take to peak. So play around with these variables and find the right ratio for your purposes. It's now the morning of day one. I've got my sourdough starter after its overnight feed. It's peak or maybe just post peak at this time. Very active, ready for its first feed of the day. So before feeding it with my usual flour mix, I'm gonna take just five grams into a fresh new jar. A tiny bit is all you need. And stir in 20 grams of water and 25 grams of whole wheat flour. And you can use the same flour mix that you plan to use for your upcoming bake. For my schedule, this ratio of one to five to four starter flour water is perfect. I can build my Levan from this starter in about seven to eight hours once it's peaked. Be sure the starter is well mixed, no dry bits remaining, and then pop it into the fresh jar, pat it down to the bottom, and place a loose fitting lid on top. We'll go ahead and let this ferment and rise at a warm temperature. I use my proofer box, and you can use your oven with the light on and the door cracked open. Anything around 78 to 82 degrees is great. Seven hours later and the starter is fully risen. It's time to build our levam. I'll take 10 grams of starter, add it to the jar. On top, 40 grams water and stir to combine. Finally, 50 grams of the whole wheat flour mix. This is the same ratio as before, one to five to four, but a bit beefed up so you'll have some extra in case you wanna continue feeding this new whole wheat starter. Mix well. I actually find that kneading the dough out on the counter can be helpful sometimes. Really completely mixes the levan. Put the levan back in the jar, mark the initial volume with a rubber band, and place somewhere warm until it's ready. Around 6 p.m. on day one, or a few hours before the levan is going to peak, I mix up my autolyse. So it's important to autolyse, or pre-soak, the whole grain flour. It gives the gluten a head start, as well as allows time for the bran to fully soak up the water. At least two hours has been sufficient in my experience, and I've gone up to four to five hours with no adverse effects. I always like to dedicate a segment of my tutorials to talk about temperature. You can use the variable of temperature to your advantage with this dough. For one thing, the cooler the temps, the longer you can run the autolyse, which may be helpful for scheduling out the process. The cooler temps will also help slow down the fermentation of the dough once you add in the levan. A slower ferment will also give you more room for error. For my method here, I'm going to be working at a pretty constant 67 to 68 degrees Fahrenheit internal dough temperature for the whole process. To maintain these temps, the dough will be kept in my cooling incubator because I'm such a nerd, but if you can find a cool spot in your house like a beverage cooler, a cooling drawer, these things will help really slow down the ferment and give you more control over the process. Let's mix our autolyse. I combine 200 grams of the Camus Red Fife and 200 grams of red wheat flour. And I'm gonna go ahead and mix by hand to combine. On top, I'm gonna to add 375 grams cool to the touch water. I use my hand to mix up the dough. So the main goal here is to fully hydrate all the dry flour bits. It can take several minutes, try to be thorough. Once well mixed, organize and round the dough in the bowl and go ahead and cover. I like to use these shower caps and place in a cool location. I'm shooting for an internal temp of 68 degrees Fahrenheit. For a few hours, we're gonna leave it here until the levan is fully peaked and ready to go. Okay, it's time to add the levan and sea salt. The levan is fully peaked and smells sour and floral. It's good not to let the peak hold too long or the aroma can become quite pungent. I'm going to inoculate this dough at a lower percentage than usual, and this is because the whole wheat dough ferments so quickly despite the cooler bulk temperature. 
Adding less levon will help keep the rate of ferment more under control. So let's add to the autolyse the 8% levon, or 32 grams levon. You can use your hand and mix it in this way, folding it into the dough, massaging the dough with your fingers. If you mix by hand, it can take about 10 minutes as the dough is more stiff, and you really want to be sure to fully mix in the levon so that it's evenly distributed into the dough. This is important, remember, because we'll be cutting off our aliquot after the mixing step here. So I actually prefer for this dough to just pop it in my KitchenAid mixer. A little spritz of water to prevent sticking, pop the dough in there, and I let the dough mix on low speed for about three to four minutes. Next is the salt. I'm going to add in a little more salt than I usually do. I like the increased saltiness with this hearty wheat loaf. So 2.2% or nine grams of salt. Just sprinkle it right on top as the dough hook goes around and let this incorporate on low speed for another three to five minutes. Now that the dough's been well mixed, it's time to pull off the aliquot for the bulk ferment stage. Remember, this aliquot, or smaller part of the whole, is going to help us to better gauge the dough rise and give us a better idea of when to shape this dough. This small spice jar can be quite useful when used properly. Be sure to go back and read about the limitations and proper usage of this jar discussed earlier in the video. So I use a bench knife and cut off a small segment of the main dough. I aim for about 30 grams. Gather the dough, give it a couple of folds, drop it down into the aliquot jar. I use my finger to just tuck it into the bottom. Try to eliminate any air bubbles at this time. Position the rubber band as to clearly mark the initial volume in the jar. With wet hands, gently but firmly stretch and fold your dough around all four sides. You will feel the dough noticeably tighten up as you do this. Then flip your dough over and round the mass of dough on the counter with your hands until it forms a nice taut ball. Transfer this to your bulking dish. Go ahead and grab your aliquot jar, get it in there, again, nice and snug up against the main dough. And then I cover the whole dish. So I use those reusable shower caps as before, and this creates a nice dome. Remember, the warmer you bulk, the faster the dough will rise, and the cooler you bulk, the slower it will rise. Now this dough is gonna rise overnight at 68 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a no-touch method, so we're just gonna wait until morning to do the pre-shape. The aliquot jar can be helpful, but usually only when you run it over and over again on the same recipe. In my several runs with this particular dough, I found it's best to final shape once the aliquot jar rises to about 100% in volume, as I mentioned previously. Before final shaping though, we're gonna need to do one pre-shape to organize and add some strength, as it's really just been sitting throughout the whole bulk period so far. It's important to give a pre-shape ahead of the final shape for a dough like this, but you must give the dough time to rest and loosen up again afterward, or your dough will just be too tight and the final shaping will be difficult. So I've actually been shooting for about a 75% rise to pre-shape. At 68 degrees Fahrenheit, this took about 12 hours. So I'll wet my hands, remove the aliquot jar from the dish, right around 75% at this point. With your hands damp and wet, you're gonna pre-shape using the coil fold technique. So this dough is very soft and puffy. Be gentle, but also be firm. The goal here is to organize the dough and create a great deal of strength by pulling and allowing the dough to coil under itself. It can take several attempts for the first of these coils as the dough is so loose and extensible. Just keep going until the dough forms a solid, firm log. Rotate the dish 180 degrees and perform the same coil on the other side. Another rotation of 90 degrees, coil again, and finally flip around 
and do the fourth side, the last coil fold. Once you've finished this, place the aliquot jar back in the dish, cover and place back in the cool spot until the dough has finished its rise. Remember, now we're just waiting for the aliquot jar to measure to the full 100% as our indicator to final shape the dough. Final shaping is going to be quite similar to what I've shown in the past. It's been about an hour since the pre-shape coil fold and the aliquot jar is now reading at just about 100% rise. The dough has had time to relax a little bit and is not overly tight to final shape. Sprinkle with all-purpose flour, the dough, and the counter, and tip out the dough. Use your bench knife to tuck the excess flour around the outer rim and then discard the remaining excess flour. Use your hands to gently pull the dough into a rectangular shape. The more careful you are to prevent degassing at this step, the more open your crumb will be, so be gentle. A side view here. Pull out one side flap of the dough and wrap it up and over into the center third of the dough mound. Pat it down with care to evenly distribute the air. Pull up and over the other side flap and rest it directly on top of the center mound. You can grab the top segment and pull up and over and then use your hands to both tuck the dough into itself and roll the dough down using the friction of the counter to create tension on the surface of the mound. Pinch the ends to seal and then sprinkle the surface with brown rice flour or white rice flour to prevent sticking of the dough to the banneton. Use your bench knife and flip the dough over, seam side up. Transfer to your banneton. Here I'm using a nine by five by four inch oval banneton with a linen liner. Cover and move the dough to the fridge for about five hours to final proof. Just one final note regarding temperature during the final proof. The colder your fridge, the less likely it will be that your dough continues to rise during this final proof stage. You can place your aliquot jar in with the shaped loaf in the fridge, but the temperature fluctuation is so extreme, I've not actually found this to be super useful. As long as your dough does not continue to rise in the fridge, and temperatures lower than about 40 degrees Fahrenheit will halt dough rise generally. You should be fine and you don't have to worry about overproofing. However, if you notice your dough does rise, consider cutting the bulk stage a little shorter and shaping your dough once it rises to a lesser degree to account for this additional rise in the fridge. So it's now been about four hours and I'm going to go ahead and preheat my oven with my cast iron challenger pan. I like to place my cast iron pans directly on a broil tray to help prevent burning of the bottom of the loaf. I'll preheat the oven for one hour to 485 degrees Fahrenheit. Once the oven and pan are fully preheated, I can go ahead and take my dough from the refrigerator and sprinkle with some semolina flour. Using a sheet of reusable parchment paper, I flip over the dough onto a peel. The dough is quite chilled and firm at this time. Using a curved razor blade on a bread lam, I slash across the surface of the dough at approximately 30 degree angle, give or take, at a quarter to a half inch depth. Now we can take the pan from the oven and carefully transfer the loaf to the pan and then cover to seal in any steam that's gonna be generated from the first half of the bake. Place the pan back in the oven and bake at 485 degrees Fahrenheit for 20 minutes. After the 20 minutes has passed, remove the lid of the pan and then shut the door. Turn the temperature down to 450 degrees Fahrenheit and continue to bake for another 15 minutes. I like to open the oven again and vent any additional steam that's been generated and then turn down the temperature again, this time to 425 degrees, and allow the loaf to finish baking for a final 7 to 10 minutes. A trick to help preserve the crispiness of the crust, turn off the oven at the end of the bake 
and crack open the door of the oven and just allow the loaf to cool in there in the dry warm oven for two hours or so. And here we go, the final 100% whole wheat loaf. Beautiful browning from the bake, a lovely shape with a proud ear, no burnt bottom, just the right amount of crackly crust exterior. Let's see inside. A tender light crumb for this type of loaf. Beautiful color from the red wheat, even fermentation and crumb structure overall, hearty and rustic with fantastic flavor. I can tell you the texture is slightly chewy. The flavor is nutty, very weedy, bold. Definite complexity from the sourdough fermentation. I'll be happy to share this with family and friends. Thanks guys for watching. I hope you found this video insightful and that it provided some new tips and techniques that can be helpful in your own kitchen. I wanted to send a message of thanks to my friend Nicole over at NMUVU. She's a whole grain guru and was kind enough to let me bounce some ideas off of and help assess my recent bakes. So thanks Nicole. Just a final note that I have for sale PDFs that you can download from the site Gumroad and I'll post the link below. These are fully supplemental forms. I just added the newest one that goes along with the tutorial here and you can find my other documents for sale and for free there as well. My basic 20% and 50% whole wheat bread recipes as well as free content on how to get started with your own sourdough starter and more. If you'd like to help support my channel and get something out of it at the same time, please check these out. For questions, please comment below and I'll do my best to answer any questions as they pop up. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more recipes and methods to come.